haven't seen you in ages. Yeah. Okay, great. Have a seat again. Thank you. Have a seat. And it is good to good to be able to greet each other, isn't it? And people we haven't seen for a while, so it's lovely. So we're going to we're going to come into the place of worship together. This is a special place, I think, even more and more so as society changes and the world that we live in changes. This opportunity to come together to to kind of retreat, as it were, into a a safe space to worship and to recenter ourselves um, in worship um, with God, but with each other as well. There's something really special about that. Of course, we can be close to God walking in the forest or by the river or in the mountains, but when we come together, there's something really meaningful in that too. So let's pray ourselves that God will, in this time of worship, speak to us, minister to us, encourage us, um, uh, excite us, even heal us, um, whatever we need him to do for us. So let me pray for us, and then we're going, to, we're going to sing. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the joy and the privilege of worship. We thank you for this, for this building, for this church. We thank you for the people who serve you in it, and it is a space where we can worship you, lifting our eyes to you, opening our hearts for you. And so we pray in this hour or so that you will come and minister to us, that you would do that work of restoration or bring comfort or healing or that you would refresh us, reinvigorate us, enliven us, encourage us. Whatever we need, we ask for your ministry. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Well, we're going to sing, and we're going to sing this lovely hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Uh, But we're going to remain seated, and we're going to sing it in stages as we reflect on the words and uh, and worship through this song together, as we use the words as prayer, as meditation, and to help us center in to to God's presence. So so, um, Sinead and Karen are going to, to lead us. We're going to sing it, but just stay seated, okay, as we work through this together, and really focus on these words. going to read these words as Shania keeps playing from Philippians chapter 2. Thinking of this father and this father's love for us and how he showed his love for us and demonstrated his love for us. And in Philippians 2 we read of the humility of Christ, how he came to be with us in humility, humbling himself. And Paul writes these words. He says that our attitude should be the same as that of Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, that he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross, and therefore God exalted him to the highest place because of his humility, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth 
and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The example we follow is the one of humility. Humility before God and humility before each other. And in that posture of humility, God, as he did with his son Jesus, will exalt us on that final day as well. So we'll sing verse 2 just now. Keep thinking of the words. words from John's gospel, again about the humility that God demonstrates through Jesus to us. God always comes to us in humility, always in humility. And we read this again in John 1, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was God and He was with God in the beginning and through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life And that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And that he was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will but born of God the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and the word used there is that he tabernacled he came and pitched his tent among us in humility to be with us this model of humility the Lord Jesus Christ who is himself equal with God the Father So we'll sing again verses 3 and 4. And why don't we stand this time?
pray to you, Father, Son, and Spirit, and we thank you for this model of humility that you have given to us, that even though you, Lord Jesus, are equal with the Father and the Spirit and the Godhead, that you did not consider that equality something to be grasped when it came to your mission of saving us. And that mission was to come and to be with us and to come in humility. And in that humility, there was power. And so we thank you for that model. We thank you for what you did for us, taking on the nature of a servant, offering up yourself to death, even death on a cross. And because of that great act of humility for us, you have been exalted to the highest place. And we cry, hallelujah to the Lamb. Bless us as we continue to worship you, Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Amen. Stay standing, sorry. If you can, if you're able, we're going to sing There is a Redeemer, another great song. This was the number one Christian song in the 1990s, I believe. Still very relevant today in the grand scheme of church life. So let's really lift our voices in this one. take a seat. Thank you. If you want to take your Bible, we're going to read our scripture for this morning. If you've been attending over the last uh, couple of months, you know that we're revisiting the parables in Luke's gospel. We're calling this Tell It Again. Um, we know these stories so well. The parables are probably amongst our favorite passages of scripture because of the story element in the parable. And we can see that picture being painted for us as Jesus tells these stories. And we've, we've looked at the parables of the, of the lost coin and the lost son and the sheep and the, the more difficult parables around the, um, the shrewd servant and 
Uh, last week, Phil was speaking with us about the parable of the persistent widow or the unjust judge, and now we're coming to this parable um, in Luke chapter 18, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Okay, that's page 1052. You kind of know this story, don't you? The Pharisee and the tax collector. The setting is a synagogue. Uh, two men are coming to pray. That's what you did in the synagogue. And you have the Pharisee who is um, praying in a, very, in a very arrogant and boastful way about how great he is. Not just how great he is, but how he is absolutely not like the despicable tax collector who should not even dare to show his face in the synagogue. And this arrogance of the Pharisee against the humility, contrast against the humility of the tax collector. And Jesus is always beating down on the Pharisees, the people that thought they were better than everyone else, the people that thought they were right and everyone else was wrong. Jesus was always beating down on them to say, that's your self-righteousness or your own goodness is not good enough. That's not how you stand before God. So we're thinking about this idea of humility versus pride this morning. So it's page 1052, Luke chapter 18, and I'm going to read from verse 9. Okay, this is the word of the Lord. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. We thank God for his word. Let's just take a moment to pray. And after this, we'll, we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. And I think the words will be on the screen for that. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is a precious gift to us. It is life, it is light, it is correction, it is challenge, and it is comfort. And it is the way that we come to know you and know about you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your teaching that has been preserved in these words. Some of it is obscure. So help us to understand those passages, reveal them to us. Some of it is simple, like these words this morning. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Help us to let those words seep into our hearts, our minds, our souls, in a way that affects our attitude that we might be people of humility before you and before others. We thank you for your example of humility. And we worship you now as the exalted one. The first will be last, and the last will be first and the one who lays down his life for his friends is the one who is worshipped above all. So we pray that your word would be a light and a lamp to us, 
that it would guide us and lead us to a better place with you. That is all we ask. And now we pray the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Even ministers get the Lord's Prayer wrong. Do you know, I panic so much about the Lord's Prayer that I always have it open in Matthew 6. My problem there was I was reading that and reading that at the same time, but it's okay. You guys got it right. We're going to sing again another little, it's, a, it's, an old, it's an old one, but it's a good one. It's about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify your name in all the earth. The singing has been really good this morning, so I encourage you to keep, keep that up and uh, that we can hear the voices. And I know that some of you can sing, very naturally can sing in other parts, not just the melody lines. Some of you can naturally harmonize, go into alto lines and bass lines. Uh, so do that. Sing that out if you find it coming naturally to you. Just sing out your tune to the Lord as we worship together. Let's stand together. Now, I'm going to have a chat to some of the boys and girls, or the younger people in the church, because anyway, there are a few of us here today. Is anyone, anyone hungry? What if I was to do this? Is anyone, anyone hungry? Would anyone like some chocolate or so? Do, do Ben? No, sorry, what age, sorry, what age are you? Two, you're two. <laughs> Would, any, would anyone, has anyone not had breakfast and might like some Smarties? I don't normally eat breakfast, so I might, who said yes at the back? Would you like some? Would you like some? Would you like some? Come on, come on. Because I, I love, 
I love Smarties, Beth. I love Smarties. <laughs> you want to come up here? Do you like Smarties? Yeah. yeah. Did you have breakfast? No. <laughs> Were you staying with your granny? Yeah. She didn't make you any breakfast? She did. She's so mean. She's so mean, isn't she? I know. Okay, right, Beth? You're one of my volunteers, okay? I need someone else. Would anyone else like these? Jaden? Yeah? I saw you looking. Come over here. Right, so we've got Jaden and Beth. Do you want to shake hands with each other and say hello? Shake hands. Hello. It's the start of something beautiful, isn't it? It's great. Okay. So you'd like these Smarties, would you? You'd really like them? Yeah? Okay, put your hand up. Hold on, you put your hand up. Hold on. What if we have a bit of a competition? Competition? What about a spelling competition? Mm -hmm. So can you spell, can you spell cat? C-A-T. Can you spell dog? C-O-T. Okay, I think it's something a bit harder. Can you spell age discrimination? No. No. Okay. Okay. So you can't you can't get my smarties because just because you know stuff. No. I, it doesn't matter. Just because you know stuff doesn't mean you get my smarties. Okay. Turn around. But everyone needs to see this lovely smarties. Okay. You can't get the smarties. But maybe you could get my smarties if you earn them. Okay, so what about a race? What about a race? Jaden, you look stunned. <laughs> right? Okay, so Beth, you go over there. And Jaden, you go over there. So you can see right up to the door. Can you see the door in front of you? See the glass door? Beth, can you see the glass door? Okay, now stand. Come back a bit, Jaden. So what you have to do is you have to run to the door, tap the door, and then run back and give me a high five. Which door? That glass door there. Yeah. yeah. See that one up there? The door that you would come in on a Sunday, okay? So I'm going to count to three. And if you win the race, you might be able to earn my Smarties, right? Okay? So you go up, touch the door, come back and slap my hand. You got it? Have you got it? Are you ready? Uh, I, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say ready, steady, go. Okay, ready, steady, go. Go on, go, 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 go. Oh, it's fifty-fifty. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Well, you both ran really, really fast, but Jaden won, so he should get the smarties, shouldn't he? Oh, he did. Eh. But I'm going to tell you something. Just because you run fast doesn't mean you can earn my Smarties. They're my Smarties. They're my Smarties, okay? But there is something you might be able to do to get my Smarties. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how good you are. But maybe it might be dependent on how rich you are. So why don't you go back you go back to your granny, Jaden, you go back to your mum, okay? And go and tell them how much you want these Smarties, okay? Just go back and say you really, really want these Smarties. And we're going to, we're going to start the bidding, okay? <laughs> now, how, Rachel, how much do you love your son? <laughs> and Dorothy, how much do you love your granddaughter? That's okay, I can take an IOU. Will we start, who wants to start off at 50 cent? 50 cent? Put your hand up if you're willing to do 50 cent. 50 cent over here. Dorothy's still hooking in her purse. Sir, would you give me, would you give me a euro, Dorothy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> earphones, I'd take earphones. 
maybe someone in that row would lend you, lend you a few quid. What about, uh, Beth, why don't you ask Marion to help you out? Marion's always got money in her purse. Well, you found your purse, great, okay. So with 50, so what will you do? Come on, Dorothy, we don't have all day. Will you give me a pound? Will you give me a euro? Five euro? Six euro, right, six euro. Rachel, would you go higher than six euro? Yeah? Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Say, what would you give me? Six, seven, ten. ten? Oh, ten. Ten. Nine. It has to be higher than ten. We've got ten over here. What are you going to? Eleven. Fourteen. Fourteen. Come on. Going once. Going twice. Sold. Sold. Sold to this man. Come on over to Aiden. Beth, come on up. 15 euro. 15 euro. Where is it? <laughs> what do you mean? Is it fake money? Oh, look. Oh, 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 oh. Look at all that. Look at all that money I got out of your granny. So that means you should get the Smarties, shouldn't you? Because you, you bought them. But you know, they're my Smarties. And it doesn't matter how much doesn't matter how much, what have you got? A, well, have you got a credit card? <laughs> it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how good you are. These are mine. You can't earn them. You can't buy them. I can only give them to you if I want to. And if it's a free gift. So do you think I should do that? Yeah? There's another tube there, isn't there? <laughs> Thankfully. So, that's for you. Stay here a minute. This is for you, but I have to take two out of it, okay? Because <laughs> if I took two out of... You can't earn them, you can't buy them, because they're mine. I can only give them to you as a gift. And if I give them to you, how do you receive them? You just put your hand out, you just take it, and you say, very welcome. Give them a round of applause. You can go back to your seats. You can go back to your seat. Thank you very much. And you might be good enough to share some of those around a little bit later. What's the point of that? Grace. God's goodness, his favor, his unmerit, our, what we don't deserve, he gives us. Not because we earn it, not because of what we've done, not because of what we can do, not because of our social standing or how much money we have. None of that, none of that makes us worthy of what God wants to give us. His gift to us, forgiveness, love, mercy, his grace is free. It's a free gift to everyone. No matter how smart you are, no matter how good you are, no matter how rich you are, it's a free gift to everyone. And all we have to do is accept it and receive it. And it's free and it's great and it's for everyone. We're going to sing another song and it's a kid's song and it's uh, Be Bold and Be Strong. So you know this one, be bold and be strong. So we're going to stand up and sing this together. The actions are really simple. Be bold and be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. I am not afraid, I am not dismayed, for I'm walking in faith and victory. So let's really sing this out.
Try it again. See how great today it is. It's just fun. Okay, you take a seat. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for taking part there today and um, participating. Uh, we're going to have our offerings um, and our gifts and tithes received. And Angie and Richie are going to uh, wait on you for that. Uh, if you're visiting, don't, don't be embarrassed. You can just pass the plate. But we all know that Dorothy has an extra... Uh, 15 quid or so to give away so take your time up there Angie but thank you very much Uh, just a couple of notices. Um, first of all, to say that um, the elders, our elders will be meeting on the 3rd of September, Saturday, taking about a half day to meet together. And uh, we just really value your prayers for that day. If you can remember, the date is in LPC News, the email. Um, so if you see that and read that, send up a prayer um, for us as we meet together to discern how we navigate um, into the autumn and, and winter season with what seems to be certain amount of uncertainty but we really do want to continue this growth back to our full expression of church life um, so do keep that in mind also you notice on the lpc news that we're looking for some volunteers that might be they have a particular calling or gifting to work with our children it's a really vital ministry um, normally before covid we would have had um, a sunday school called j club um, just out meeting out here during the sermon time and uh, we need some people to help lead with that in September. Um, that is one of the ministries of the church that I can't be involved with directly because I'm here doing this on a Sunday. So if it's something that you feel um, called to um, or gifted, a ministry you'd be gifted in and you could give uh, one or two Sundays a month uh, to help there, that's teaching children some of the Bible stories, praying with them, serving them some juice and biscuits and just um, being a good influence and example in their lives, then do reply back to 
the office email address or phone number or talk to me after the service um, and I'll be able to point you in the right direction. So think about that prayerfully and carefully, please. Also, um, I was informed this morning that a former member of the church and a friend of the fellowship here, Linda Justin, um, her mother passed away and uh, um, the funeral will be on Tuesday in Port Leash. So just to remember Linda, if you know her, to remember her in your prayers in the family circle. Let's just take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for these tithes and offerings given in your name for the work of your church and your kingdom. We thank you for the generosity of your people here who so um, generously give to this work. We pray that you would bless this in Jesus' name. And for all those things we have mentioned, the elders meeting, the need for J-Club teachers, and for Linda and her family, uh, we offer those up as prayers to you and ask that you would hear our prayer and continue to bless us in our work and our ministry. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning's passage um, is a very familiar parable given to a certain type of person. We just heard that. Um, because Jesus tells us exactly who this parable is for. He says, to those who are confident in their own righteousness and look down at everyone else. For, in other words, Jesus is telling this parable to people who he considers to be proud and arrogant, particularly in their faith. So we're going to look at the issue of pride as we think of this parable this morning. And we're going to look at two problems with pride before we come to the solution so that we can have a real genuine confidence in overcoming this, um, this sin that would be in our lives. That might be, well, that's probably um, Billy Graham Ministries phoning, asking if I'm available to fill their vacancies. So two problems and then one solution. The first problem we encounter with pride is that it blinds us. It blinds us. The lie that pride keeps telling us is that we're fine. We're all right. Pride gives us a quiet confidence, or maybe in the case of this parable, not so quiet confidence, um, that everything is okay. Whose phone is it? Very, it's very loud, Josie. Oh, sorry. Are we good? That's okay. It's fine. So it gives us this, this lie it tells us is that we're fine. It gives us a comfort and that we're doing okay with our lives. That's what pride does for us. We're fine. And surely that's a good thing. It's a good thing to be reassured that we're fine and everything's okay if it's based on the right things, if it's true. But the problem is that we don't like to think of ourselves as not being fine. We don't like to admit that we could be wrong. We don't like to admit that we're not doing so well. And so we come up with all sorts of reasons to convince us that we actually are fine. And pride always says that we're fine um, and always says that we're right. If you're full of pride, you'll always be saying, well, I'm fine and I'm all right. Maybe if you know your stuff, you've got your life under control, We've got a lot of things uh, going for you, but pride can blind you to the reality that lies behind some of that veneer. And in this passage, we're invited to look at these two people and to judge which of them is really fine before God. It says that two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and one was a tax collector. There's two regular blokes going to the temple to pray. Well, actually, they're two very irregular blokes because they they represent the two very extremes in society. That's what Jesus is doing. He's painting a picture of extremes. The Pharisee was the very best in society, and the tax collector was the very worst in society. Now, because many of us are familiar with this passage, we tend to forget who in this story is the best and who is the worst. And we tend to criticize the Pharisee because Jesus often condemned the Pharisees in his teachings, and we have that resonating in our mind. So we think we condemn the Pharisee and we will big up the tax collector. But the people that were originally hearing this parable, they would not have had that prejudice as they were listening. They would have heard this story being told by Jesus and they would have been thinking, well, of course, it's the Pharisee who's right. And it's the tax collector who's the most despicable. Tax collector would have been a traitor 
to his own people, someone who lined his own pockets at the expense of people like Dorothy, who's pulling out money from to get the free grace and all that kind of stuff. The tax collector would have been embezzling money, robbing money, very unsavory character, no one like the tax collector. What, what equivalent would you, would you think in your own mind of a tax collector in the modern world? What's that? Traffic campers, campers. Yeah, traffic wardens. Anyone here a traffic camper? But yes, people who we feel have been unjustly under 60. Clamp tickets. How often does that happen to you? How often do you get clamped? A lot. Okay. We have this really good that we're listening to and we're going to the Pharisee. He's a good man, tax collector. He's like the traffic clamper. He's always a out of their hard arm unjust way. Um, so this is what they were thinking. And what happens here is we have this Pharisee, um, and he's the one that we know is full of pride, and he obviously thinks he's got no concerns of his own whatsoever. And he has convinced himself of this. And he has this distorted view of himself, and he presumes that he is fine by comparison. Look what happens when he opens his mouth, okay? So he opens his mouth and he says this. This is his prayer. This is the Pharisee's prayer. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Like this is a crazy prayer, isn't it? I thank you that I am not like other people. Oh Lord, you must really have your hands full with this world. And I'm just so glad that you've got me, Lord. Look at the state of our society. Isn't it producing terrible people like these tax collectors and wheel clampers? At least you've got a good one in me. That's his prayer. That's the tone of his prayer. It's ridiculous. See, he sees himself as morally superior. And when you stick him next to the tax collector, actually he does look morally superior. But that's just it, you see. How he looks and how he appears. He's looking along the row at those around him when he actually should be looking up to God. He's looking along the row instead of looking up to God. Have you ever done that? you ever done that? you ever come to church, this place of worship, this temple, if you like, to pray and to look up to God, to meet with God, but actually you find yourself looking along the row? Come here to come under God's word, but instead you look along the line and you think, well, that message this morning, I know who that's for. I know who needed to hear that. I'm so glad they were at church this morning to hear those words. Thinking about other people, of thinking about ourselves and focusing on the other distorts our few of ourselves. Think on the ways that we look along the row. Maybe you take comfort in the lack of really obvious sin in your life. You know, maybe you, you so rarely feel guilty because you know what's going on with so and so across the aisle. You compare yourself to them and you think, well, my goodness is justified by not being as bad as that other person. Say, you know what? I've been a Christian for a lot more years than those around me. And I don't think that my thinking needs to be challenged. I'm sound. Everyone else that needs to hear this. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm all right. Everyone else has got it all wrong. Well, imagine for a moment you're waiting at the doctors to be seen. I'm sure we've all been in that situation. You're sitting in the waiting room. You're waiting for your name to be called. You're going to be called into the doctor's surgery. Uh, and when you're called in, you chat away to them during your checkup. And imagine you say to the doctor, you're sitting down in front of the doctor, and you open your mouth, and you say, Oh, doctor, you have such a busy day ahead of you. Um, but, you know, I'm fine. But I want you to know that there's some real sorry states out there in the waiting room. There's some awful cases. Some people, they're really, really sick. They make me so glad that I haven't got what they've got. I thought I'd just come in and let you know that. Now we can all go to the doctors and find several people that have really bad conditions. And we can go searching for what's wrong with other people and think it has no bearing on our own health. But it does. Compare yourself to those who are well. And spiritually speaking, there is only one that is well. Only one who we can compare ourselves to, and that is Jesus. But our pride doesn't let us do that. Our pride wants us to measure ourselves 
against other people. So pride also blinds us in a second way, because it causes us to focus on what, um, on what we do to give us an elevated view of ourselves. So look at the Pharisees' own self-assessment in verse 11. And let's bear in mind that we've got no reason to believe that this Pharisee is lying. Um, so surely, by his own account, this guy is pretty fine. So he is someone who will, I don't know, he's someone who will look after your wallet for you. Um, you'll never find him hanging out with the wrong people. Um, he won't be eyeing up your wife when you're not looking. Um, as a religious guy, I would say he probably looks like he has it all together. He's probably pretty devoted. He says he fasts twice a week. Um, if he was a member of LPC, he'd be at church every week. He'd be regular at home group and prayer meetings. He probably wouldn't miss an email. He'd always reply to you. He'd be the first one to volunteer to teach at J Club come September. He loves to pray, and he'd pray with other people after church. Um, he'd be leading in a small group Bible study. He gives a tenth of everything that he has, and that's before tax. And then when he runs into some extra money, he doesn't delay in tithing the elements of that either. See, when you look at this guy, he seems like a really decent guy. He's got it all sorted out. He's got it all together. You'd love to have more of these people in church, wouldn't you? Maybe not. Well, if you go by what he gets right, then sure. But his pride has elevated him above where he is actually at. He's not actually a model of compassion, is he? Certainly not a model of humility. We might have to conveniently ignore his judge judgmentalism. He could be a decent guy, apart from all the other sin that he failed to mention. He only mentioned the things that are good. What about all the other stuff? It's not right. Go back to the doctors again. Our friend at the doctor's surgery. Look how happy he is. Having a great time, right? Oh, doctor, it pleases me to inform you that I am in great health today. Did you know that I exercise regularly twice a week? I go to the gym. And did you know that I eat healthily too? I have a very balanced diet, not too much, not too little, plenty of greens. Did you know that I'm free from infection because I'm such a clean person? I wash my hands regularly. I have antibacterial gel in my pocket just in case. I always wear a mask in public. I even did that before COVID. We can't just be convinced that we're fine and talk about all that's right and good about us and neglect to see what's not good and what's not right with us. The biggest problem with pride is that it condemns us. Our friend of the doctor, he's made his case and he's smiling. He's compared himself to every other sorry case sitting in the waiting room. He's shown and told all the lovely things he's doing, which are part of his lovely health style. And as a result, he says to the doctor, finally, doctor, thanks for listening to me. And thank you for your time. You must be so busy with all these sick people you meet. And I've seen some of them out there, so I won't take up any more of your time. In fact, I feel just great having spent this time with you, telling you all about my great health. And he would get up and he would walk out that door and he could condemn himself by his pride to an early grave. Because for all his chat about how well he is, unbeknown to him, underneath his skin, would be a ticking time bomb waiting to explode. If only he stopped affirming himself and actually make the doctor make his assessment of him on his health, then he would soon have become aware that perhaps he had extremely high blood pressure. And so was anything but healthy. And so in the same way, this Pharisee, who has made all this noise about how great he is before the great physician, well, he isn't. He isn't. We find out by verse 14 that this man didn't go home justified before God. And worst of all, he was blinded by his pride, and he was none the wiser and has no idea what's coming his way. See, for us today, if we keep turning up here, but don't actually let the great physician make his assessment of us, then we will be condemned in that same way. Pride will condemn us because we're judged not in comparison with others, but we're judged in comparison to the God 
who we come to worship and to hear from. God doesn't judge us in comparison with the person sitting beside you. He doesn't say, okay, you're the best in this church. Do you get in? We have 10 places, top 10 get in. He doesn't do that. That's not how it works. He judges you next to his righteousness that he calls you into. He judges you in comparison with his holiness, which he stands you next to. And when we are put next to his righteousness and his holiness, not one of us is right or is holy or is good or is well. And if our pride gets in the way, it prevents us from getting the real diagnosis of our hearts. Pride condemns us because we're judged merely not by what we do, but in whom we believe. Who did the Pharisee believe in? He believed in himself. Of course he believed in himself because he's a very religious man. And I expect other people believed in him too. And after all, if he's not all right, then who can be? Look at all that he's done. Surely that's enough to win God over. Surely he's built up enough credit with God to be fine. But his pride condemned him. Because nothing we can do can atone for our sin. We can't earn back God's favor. We saw with the smarties. We're not perfect. Let's look back just for a moment, tax collector, as opposed to the Pharisee. He doesn't look along the line. He's not comparing himself to other people. He's not looking around to see what's what or who's who in the temple. In fact, the tax collector doesn't even lift his head. His head is bowed. He knows that he has nothing to offer society or God. And his reluctance to draw near, as he is at a distance, is because he is aware of his sinfulness. And he knows that God hates sin. So he needs to get rid of that sin. And he recognizes that he can't fix himself. That he can't up his game. He can't turn things around. He can't change his spots, not by himself. And so he does the only thing that he can do, and he pleads to God for mercy. He knows he's anything but okay. He knows he's anything but fine. So with his head bowed in this place of prayer, he calls out to God for mercy. But this revelation of him not being fine doesn't send him into despair because he looks outside of himself to be made right. He casts himself on God's mercy and he was the one who went home justified before God. Interesting fact, when the tax collector asked for mercy, the literal translation is that he says, propitiate me. It means make atonement for me. Make me right by what you have done. That's what he's asking. He's saying, I cannot be made right on my own. You make me right. You give me something that makes me right. Give me something that I don't deserve. Give me something that I haven't earned. Give me something that people around me think that I don't need. You need to give this to me. Clothe me with your own righteousness. Propitiate me. Atone for me. Make me right by doing for me only what you can do. And of course he is made right. And the place where we're made right is at the cross where Jesus died. And if we want to overcome our pride, then we look to the cross, which is a symbol of humility, isn't it? Humbly cast ourselves upon God's mercy that can only be found there. And the cross dispels pride because it attacks the way pride blinds and condemns us. And we can look, uh, so we don't look along the line and compare ourselves to other people, but instead look to the cross and look to the cross where Jesus is and say, do it for me. Do it for me. So if we're to overcome pride, then we must start and continue and end at recognizing our need for God's mercy in Christ. We can't overcome our pride by a list of do's, don'ts, or some top ten tips to avoid pride. This is all self-improvement. All we can do is come humbly, humbly before a merciful God and say, I am no better than anyone else. And before you, a holy God, I stand in judgment. Give to me your righteousness. Freely give it so that I might be right before you. Let's cast ourselves on God's mercy now as we pray. Let's pray together.
Lord, we thank you for your great mercy you've shown us in Christ. Lord, we humbly cast ourselves upon your mercy now because we know, we should know, that we're not fine on our own. We're not okay. We haven't got it all together. Yet you can make us right. You can make us okay. You can atone for our sin. And amazingly, give us confidence of coming before you and experiencing your favor, which is free to us. Lord, we ask that you would eliminate within us all confidence that's placed in ourselves, for that condemns us. And we ask that we would only put our confidence in you. And we ask this only because of your Son. Amen. Well, we're going to sing to finish off our service and then go and have some tea, coffee, and maybe you want to chat about this um, over tea and coffee or talk to me about it. Had some good conversations last week. Um, So we have time to do that and enjoy fellowship together. So we're going to stand and close service. We're going to sing um, last time, which is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Choose this because this is what the Pharisee was not doing. He was not turning his eyes upon Jesus. He was looking to everyone else. But we have to turn our eyes upon Jesus and look to him and for, all, for all of our help and all of our solution. So let's sing this together.
share the words of the benediction together. Let may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Please stay for some tea, coffee. Don't rush away.